Large Cross Building talk, and please welcome to the presenters of today. It's really not going to be that good. Okay. <laughs> so today we have uh, an exciting all-day session of cross building, multi arch, and arm stuff. Uh, it's going to be great. So uh, I get to start. So the idea is we'll have uh, a talk now where I basically present what's the current state of affairs and what works and what doesn't and how to use the, all this marvelous new tech, which kind of works. And then um, the next session, uh, I want to talk about some of the things that are still broken and what exactly we think we should be doing about it. Um, there's lots of things we could do, uh, and there's a question of how much extra work to impose on other maintainers, what we think we can get away with. Uh, and so on. So, um, I'll just tell you a bit about how we got to where we are and the current infrastructure that's been built to give us some idea of, of what works and what doesn't, how the new multi arch cross building works as opposed to the old cross building ways of doing things, um, and some details about the mechanisms involved, uh, all the things which still don't work. Um, and why, uh, where we've got to, and then there's a kind of sub-talk, which is basically Johannes Schauer's bootstrapping work. So technically, bootstrapping is separate from cross-building, except that in practice it isn't, uh, so they go together quite well. So uh, for those of you, how many people here know all about this already? About half, OK. So. Um, we always have to have this at the beginning because the terminology is incredibly confusing, and anybody who hasn't done a lot of it will be confused. So uh, this is the GNU terminology for build machines and host machines and target machines. So when we say host, we don't mean the machine you're building on. We mean the thing you're building for. Uh, when we say build, we mean the thing you're building on, not the thing you're building for. Obvious, isn't it? Uh, and target, you only use when talking about compilers, um, which build code for a particular thing, but can build it on another architecture. So most of this is all about build and host. Host is what you're building for. Build is what you're building on. So there has been cross-building support in Debian for many years. Um, Roman Hodek started Dpackage Cross in 1997, um, which was a horrible hacky script. Uh, kind of worked. Um, and that's been developed by various people who've taken an interest uh, over the intervening 15 years. Uh, and we still need it, uh, although much of what it does is becoming irrelevant. Um, Mdebian's been providing cross tool chains for many years. Uh, that's still the place to get tool chains that work on Debian. Um, the major other part, apart from actually having a cross compiler, is being able to install the build dependencies um, in a cross aware fashion. And uh, apt-cross was the first tool for doing that some time ago. Uh, I wrote a shell script, and Neil made it into some proper software. Um, that had various issues. Uh, it's complicated, uh, and it mostly broke. So we've had various other attempts since. xapt is a much simpler approach to the same problem. pdbuildcross is a mechanism for uh, wrapping that in a cheroot and building things. Meanwhile, uh, over in Ubuntu land, uh, Colin Watson wrote Chromium OS build because they needed a way of cross-building Chromium OS, uh, and that got later renamed to Xdeb, which is actually quite a useful tool for installing dependencies and cross-building things using the dpackage cross mechanism. Uh, yeah, I guess I should, now is the time to mention that what dpackage cross does is takes libraries from the host architecture, the other architecture, um, and then mangles all the files around to different paths uh, so that the cross tools can find them and you can install them on your build architecture. Uh, and that's how we've been doing cross compiling for the last 15 years. Um, more recently, Lenaro started doing work on this. Uh, that's who's paying me to do this, so thank them for progress. Um, so there's a set of cross tool chains uh, in, which are now in Ubuntu, uh, which work pretty well. Uh, but are built in a kind of ugly way. The details are not nice. 
Uh, and the last year, I've set up a cross-build daemon because I got very bored of building things and trying things and seeing if it worked and then building them again to see if they work today. So I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, more recently, we've, since MultiArch became available, we can now do much cleverer things. Uh, the system is a lot more reliable in terms of installing cross dependencies. Uh, so sbuild now understands how to do that. So it's now trivial to just say sbuild something in a cross way. And in principle, that should just work. And most recently, uh, Tibalt Gurkha has been working on um, multi-arch cross tool chains which are built using multi-arch as well as which can build things using multi-arch. I'll explain the difference in a bit. So in order to see what works and what doesn't, uh, we have a cross-build daemon. Uh, it's online, um, there's the URL. Um, so you can go there, uh, that is currently building all of stable and quantal, not all of, sorry, about 300 packages of. Um, and that gives us a pretty good idea of where we're at. Um, just to explain how this works, this is actually useful outside the cross-build concept. Um, at the moment, as many of you have probably discovered, it's hard to set up build Ds, um, and it really shouldn't be. Uh, we, lots of people could use one for all sorts of reasons. Um, so uh, because the official Debian build infrastructure is incredibly complicated and hard to install, I didn't use that. Uh, it's RepriPro does the repository part, uh, and there's a handy tool called RebuildD which is a fairly stupid build daemon, but if all you wanted to do was build some stuff for a distro, or maybe uh, a couple of suites in a distro, it's great. Um, anyone can understand how to configure it, you just install it and it works. I've hacked it about a bit so that it understands cross-building, that's not upstream yet. Um, and that just uses sbuild to do all the hard work, which does understand cross-building, so this is fairly simple. You pull stuff from the upstream archive, uh, I've got a filter set to just do the 300 packages we care about for now, source packages, that is. Um, then RepRepro has a handy thing called build needing, which basically says how many binaries are out of date in comparison to the sources I've got, and gives you a big list. And you just feed that into rebuild D, which then churns through them all. Uh, and the output of sbuild uh, goes into RepRepro, uh, and it will run around in circles until they're all done. Um, this is kind of tied together. All the little green bits are horrible cron jobs and scripty foo, which isn't very nice. Um, I've started an X builder package which contains the kind of glue bits, uh, and that will uh, ideally one day just be something you can just say, kind of app to get installed, build D, and you'll get something fairly simple which works. That will be, be nice. We're not quite there yet, but it's, it's reasonably usable. And uh, that build these sync logs thing at the end. This is all running on uh, my machine at work at the moment. Uh, so I just suck all the logs over to the web so that you can read it all online. I should have, if anyone's got um, their browsers up, you can go and have a look at the pretty statistics. It's quite nice. I should have shown a picture on here. So some statistics. As you can see, they're not great. So this, this kind of 99 packages we're looking at here is basically the debootstrap set, um, what you need for a minimal system. Uh, and as you can see, we got to nearly half of it working in precise uh, before um, we stopped fiddling with that um, and then broke everything again. So Ubuntu does better because more things have been multi-arched, basically. Um, there's a lot of basic tools in Debian which still don't say, I'm multi-arch foreign, which is code for the right thing will be installed. So as you can see, we get 65 dependency failures out of those 99, which basically means I couldn't install the dependencies. I didn't even try and build it. Um, the, these bugs are astonishingly easy to fix. It's a one-line patch for every package that needs fixing. Just go and fix them all. Uh, as you can see, there's quite a lot of stuff that would build if its dependencies were installable. Um, so if anyone's enthused to help with this, it's, um, it's very easy, quite rewarding. You know, fixed, that was easy. Um, and I'd love some help, because it takes ages. So if you want to build things, um, you need a tool chain. That's the easy part. Um, you also need to be able to install 
the build dependencies. So the point about this is um, you need the libraries for the host architecture, but you need the tools for the build architecture so that they'll run on the build machine. So you want a version of Intel tool or libtool or autoconf or whatever that runs on the build machine, whereas you want um, libfoo, this, that, and the other for the host architecture. Uh, and this has always been historically problematic. Um, but multi-arch essentially marks which is which for us, and we can use that information to just tell apps to install the stuff. Um, there are some exceptions to what multi-arch says, uh, which we mark in the build dependency headers. And I'll show you the exciting table for that in a bit. Um, Depackage cross. Yeah, so the other thing you need is the stuff where you can't run tests during the build because it's the wrong architecture. You need to cache the answers somehow. Um, and Autoconf has a nice mechanism that's worked for at least a decade that does this. Uh, and Depackage cross supports that. And the other thing is, is avoiding running tests which you can't run because it's the wrong architecture, either because you'll get the wrong answer or you simply can't run the test. Um, so multi-arch tool chains. Now, when we say that, we mean two different things. Uh, I need to be clear about which is which. So there's the tool chain understanding the new multi-arch paths as opposed to the old sysroot style lib libdir paths. So basically where it looks for headers and libraries. Um, I'm not going to read the list out, but um, we used to look in user triplet blah, uh, and now we don't do that anymore. Um, the other half is, does the tool chain itself use the multi-arch mechanisms to depend on libraries? So your, your ARM cross tool chain depends on an ARM libc. And historically, we used to take that, munge it about with dpackage cross, build against it, and generate a package called uh, ARM L cross, uh, libc ARM L cross. Um, there's no need to do that anymore. We can just say install libc colon armel and use that. Um, seems to me that's how it should work. Um, and that is the work that Tibolt has basically just done as part of a GSOC project over the last few weeks. That's working, basically. We tested it yesterday. As far as we can tell, it works. There's some ifs and buts and a very long argument about libstudc++ dev we have for most of yesterday. Uh, <laughs> but once that's sorted, so those are already available in the repository at, um, I should have stuck the URL in here, uh, mdebian.org twiddle um, tibg, uh, and you can try them out. Do please tell us if you find anything bust about that tool chain. That will become, I hope, the default mdebian tool chain. And the advantage of building it that way is that it can be built by an auto builder within the archive. The old way of building tool chains is special and there's no way the auto builders would ever really do that um, because it depended on things from other architectures. And until multi arch we had no mechanism for specifying that. So um, these new tool chains should be something which will eventually end up in the standard archive. That is the goal uh, during Wheezy plus one. But we've managed to sneak a little bit into dpackage such that these cross-architecture dependencies will work in Wheezy. So you will be able to use these cross-compilers before they're actually official and kosher. Um, the autoconf caching mechanism, so this is just how it works. Dpackage cross provides a load of files, uh, well, crossconfig.cache for the generic stuff, and crossconfig.arch for things which are arch specific, which contain lots of incredibly boring information, like how big is a float on this architecture, um, and then lots of, I don't know what GL is, um, some library or other, does it have this function or not, um, where autoconf would normally run a, a little, compile a little program and run a test and see if it worked. If it can't do that, we just ask it. Now, the problem with this information, of course, is that it can go out of date if nobody's maintaining it. But by having a centralized list, it should be easy to keep it right. And in general, this mechanism works just fine. Um, you'll find you can cross-build a lot of stuff, and it appears to have worked, but in fact, for example, um, if you haven't got this right, you'll get no job control in your bash. So, you know, it works, but job control is quite handy. Um, there are quite a lot of variables not set in here that probably should be. Uh, you need to go through 
uh, builds and find out what's actually broken. So one thing, in the last couple of years of cross-building work, I've cross-built an awful lot of stuff. I have tested that very little of it actually works. Uh, <laughs> once we're at a stage where you can build a whole image, um, we will need to do a lot more testing to prove that the stuff we're cross-building is in fact churning out things that work properly. And if anyone's interested in that, we have a load of ideas and nobody's done any of the work needed. You could compare the ELF layouts and see whether you've got the same parts and check for bits that are accidentally parts of foreign architectures and so on. So we have all the core pieces, um, but to make this work smoothly within Debian, you need a whole load of extra bits. So we have Build Essential for building things, which you know, ensures that you have a compiler and um, make and a whole load of basic tools that you won't get anywhere without. We need the same concept for cross-building to ensure that you have a cross-compiler for this architecture and uh, a cross-libc and a cross-libc++ um, and cross-package config and so on. So for a long time, the set of packages you needed to cross-build in Ubuntu and Debian has been slightly different because the tool chains are coming from different sources and slightly different names are used. And that's very annoying for a package like sbuild that just wants to be able to say, install me the cross stuff, please. So uh, sbuild now installs build essential arch name and expects that to be present and to gloss over any uh, differences between uh, distros. And obviously, if you're using this for your own work, you can just provide your own cross build arch, which will say, you know, if you're the CLang weirdo, then uh, you can just say, I need CLang for my cross builds. Um, some packages exist in um, Patrick McDermott's repository. They're not anywhere very useful yet. Uh, they will be soon. Uh, it's trivial to make. I mean, it's just a, it just depends on six things. Um, the other problem is that because of the way the GCC defaults mechanism works, if you install a tool chain, you don't actually get a command ARM um, Linux GNU ABI GCC. Um, so you only get ARM um, Linux GNU ABI GCC version. Um, so every single autoconf test will fail and say, you have no compiler. I can't compile anything. Uh, technically, it's correct. So there has to be a, a, a cross GCC defaults package or something that provides that link. So you can just make it yourself. Um, and one of the questions for later is, which package should provide that link exactly? I have wondered about this, and I'm not quite sure. Um, the toolchain people think it should be a GCC cross defaults package, and they're probably right. But um, at the moment, you just don't get one on the Debian stuff, and it doesn't work. Um, cross package config. So package config is perfectly capable of doing cross stuff, but you have to call it in the right way by calling it as triplet package config. So it knows which paths to use when looking things up. Otherwise, it'll look up your host libraries instead of, sorry, your build libraries instead of your host libraries. Um, again, there's a question of where should, and so there's a wrapper in the package config uh, package, um, which you just need to call as triplet package config. And again, the question is where do all those links come from? Which package provides them? Because um, you get one per architecture. Uh, so it's a package per architecture containing a link. And you go, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I haven't thought of a better way. And this problem will apply to quite a lot of tools. Anything which does architecture-dependent work needs to be called as triplet tool. It's the only way to make everything work properly everywhere. And the, the kind of question is, where are we going to produce all this useless, tiny packages from? Um, so multi-arch cross-dependencies and how it actually works. Um, There's this annoying autoconf convention that you don't do it for the native version. You don't call uh, on x86 underscore 64 Linux GNU GCC every time you run GCC. Uh, that would be lovely. That would improve my life dramatically. I wouldn't have thousands and thousands of, if natively building, run GCC, otherwise run triplet GCC. The triplet GCC, that's not necessarily an autoconf default. It's probably just that the autoconfs Speak concerned are very old. Um, a, a lot of the autoconf 
uh, rebuilds and things like that, and, and the, the auto reconf, a lot of that work will actually allow the triplet to work even with a native compilation. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot of it places could just where be an auto if you problem. could always call triplet something and it worked, that would make things more symmetric. And of course, the whole point about multi-arch is that it's nice and symmetric, and that's one of the pieces that's missing. So yes. Um, so uh, for people who haven't been following multi-arch in detail, it's another fine example of, of confusing terminology. Um, Packages can be labeled as one of three things. Uh, if they're multi-arch same, sorry? Four things. Four things, oh, including nothing, you mean? OK, yes. Um, you can say nothing, um, and generally things will behave as they did before, or correctly. Um, if you want things to be co-installable, where things in practice is usually libraries, so if you want to be able to install the build version and the host version side by side, you need to mark the multi-arch same and make sure that none of the files that are different have the same file name. Um, in general, that's a matter of putting libraries in uh, user lib triplet, um, whatever. Um, anything which you just want to run, and it doesn't matter what architecture it is, you just need it to work, so make, or um, intel tool, or um, orc, all that stuff, that's a multi-arch foreign package. And the main reason most stuff doesn't work at the moment is because an awful lot of things that are tools like that are not marked multi-arch foreign. So it tries to install the host arch version and then fails to run it. There are some things which can be either. Uh, get text is actually the most common example, things which contain both a library you link against and a tool you run. And it depends on the package you're trying to build which of those two functions it wanted. So multi-arch can't tell us which we want. It just says you can do either of these things, and you need to specify in your dependencies which you want. Uh, that's basically it. Um, so to use this, uh, all you have to do is add the foreign architecture you wish to build, and now you can do app get build dep dash a architecture package. Uh, and that should install the build dependencies. Quite a lot of the time it doesn't, uh, but when it works, it's incredibly cool. <laughs> um, this is this scary table of exactly what happens depending on what you specified in your build dependency and what the multi-arch field says. Uh, and the, the any and native are the exception mechanisms for saying, I wanted the opposite of the default, basically. And there's a set of things which you're simply not allowed to have that's wrong. It's all a bit confusing. Mostly only apt people need to worry about this. Um, there is an interesting point. So about the marking lots of things multi-arch foreign, um, there's about 1,000 tools that that will be useful for. Um, but in fact, uh, as uh, Steve has worked out over there, we could just fix apt so that for build dependencies, uh, it goes, well, if it's an architecture all package, it's almost certainly effectively multi-arch foreign, so let's just assume that. Now, we don't do that for normal dependencies because that will be the opposite of the existing behavior, um, and everything will blow up. Um, we could change it in the future, um, but we can't do it now. So unless anyone objects violently, we should probably just do that, and loads of stuff will start working. Uh, we have to argue with the dpackage people a bit, um, which is a pending argument, but unless someone can come up with a reason why we shouldn't, uh, we should probably try and push that. It's a bit late for Wheezy, I guess, sadly. Um, transitive build dependencies, this is something you'll notice if you're maintaining any packages that have a kind of a versionless library dependency, which actually depends on a particular version of the library that we're currently making in the default. Um, those used to generate, so libdb dev used to be an arch all package. And the problem is that that breaks the multi arch um, architecture chain because it now doesn't know which architecture version of the library you wanted. Um, so we need to make libdb dev any so that it then depends on a corresponding architecture version of the actual library. Um, so there's quite a few of those that are bust, but I don't know, maybe we've fixed most of them by now. but. Um, it's not entirely obvious, if you haven't thought about this for quite a long time, how that should work. So I thought I'd put it in. Things that don't work. 
Um, running wrong architecture tools. So quite a lot of builds will try and run something they just built. Uh, and of course, when you're cross-building, that doesn't work. Um, we should stop them doing that. Uh, that's fine, except when they do something really important. <laughs> um, and life gets harder. So quite a lot of things use help to man, for example, which is extremely annoying if you're a cross-builder. All it does is run the package to get the help output and then put it in the man page. Seems perfectly reasonable, except we can't do that. Um, now, that one doesn't matter much. You can just skip it, and you don't get a man page boff. Um, but they need doing. Otherwise, the build just fails. Uh, or you can use QEMU. Um, so QEMU can gloss over a lot of the failures I'm about to go through, which is great if you've got one. But for example, for the new ARM64 bootstrap, which I'm currently doing, there is no QEMU. There will not be a QEMU for some time. Uh, that doesn't help us at all. So I'm, I'd like to fix as much as we can without depending on QEMU. But uh, it is trivial for you to make your cross-build essential cheroot have QEMU support as well, at which point a whole load of failures will just kind of get glossed over and mostly work. Um, config scripts. Loads of packages contain a, a naff little config script which tells you uh, how it was built. Uh, that's great until you're trying to cross-build things, at which point you get the wrong answers. Um, the fix for most of these is to persuade the people to use package config instead, because package config is declarative and it just works uh, in a cross-context. Uh, all these things don't. Uh, and there's interesting questions. TCL config is a question of where that should live in multi-arch world. That's one of the other things to get clear later. Um, some packages don't cross-install. So libraries which run some kind of helper to register plugins or something, um, when you install the wrong architecture version of it, it runs its post int and explodes. Uh, and that's very annoying, because you only wanted it for the headers, uh, or to link against it. You couldn't care less about the stupid plugin thing. Um, so we fixed libglib uh, by basically just saying, um, don't care if it fails. Now, I don't know if there are packages where these scripts are important, and you'd really want the package installed to fail um, when it's done natively, in which case we need a bit of, if I'm doing this natively, then can bitch. Otherwise, just it's all right. It doesn't matter. Um, there aren't loads. I, I went through the list of you know, in 300 packages. There's the only five I found. Um, they need fixing. There are tools which ha are architecture dependent. Um, so charpath is a thing for editing the R path in binaries you've just built, and it uh, is used in a reasonable number of builds. Uh, and the problem is it needs to know about the architecture that it's fiddling with the ELF headers in in order to do the right thing. And it assumes it's just being done natively at the moment, so that always fails. Now, in practice, we can just not do it. Um, I don't know if it ever matters. Um, I'd like to hope not, because we don't like RPath anyway. Um, object introspection is a much bigger problem. Uh, that does scary stuff with binaries to look at the object interfaces and generate XML foo for, I don't know what the hell these people do. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's used a lot. At the moment, we've been able to just not run it, and nothing died. Uh, but I really don't think that's going to work for long. Uh, <laughs> the output it produces is architecture-specific, and the binaries it scans are done in an architecture-specific way. Um, Gloss over it with QEMU, I don't know. Uh, really, I think you need a cross-object introspector. Um, but I, I need someone who will explain what it does and why and how hard it might be to make a cross one. And, and some help would be great on that. Um, so if you're a packager, what do you need to do? Uh, there are some cross-build package guidelines where we started writing down you know, things to do and things to not do. Um, in general, if you now, there's a handy little dpackage since some fairly recent version of dpackage, there's a little header thing to save you putting the boilerplate that's in hundreds of packages in yourself, which sets the multi-arch variables and the host and the build variables. You just include that, and you'll have the variables you need. Um, and if you use package config and auto tools or CMake, i.e. Uh, build systems that actually work, um, generally, things will be sorted out for you. Uh, and deb helper, actually. All of these things generally will do the right stuff. If you do anything clever, it gets harder. 
Um, there's also there's another uh, wiki page Peter Pierce wrote, which contains a lot of useful info, like a description of the uh, object introspection problem. So uh, I haven't got time to go through all these slides because there's quite a lot of it. Uh, it's very interesting, but I'll just give you a flavor of what we're doing for the bootstrapping stuff. So uh, there's a thing called libdos, which is what the Debian weather thing is done with um, by Pietro Abato for how much of the... It's, it's, uh, it's basically OCaml tools for examining dependency relationship foo and statistical. It's all it's really scary stuff. Um, but <laughs> we can use it uh, to say, in order to build this, what do I need? And what does the network look like? Um, and you can just download these tools and try them out. So we have uh, a tool to uh, examine the build system. Uh, let's get this right. Source packages that are required to be cross-compiled for a minimum build system. Yes, yeah, so how many things do I need to build in order to build this set of packages? Um, and also checking whether the packages, sources of binary packages actually match up, because it turns out they don't in Onyeric or Quantal. Um, but we seem to get it right in Debian. Um, and the problem is that it, it blows up the tools. If, if, it, if you've got a binary that there isn't a corresponding source for it, it says, well, I can never build that. Um, I'm screwed. Um, so the thing about bootstrapping is you've always got to cross-build something, because you've got a brand new machine with no software for it, you can't do anything until you've got essentially build essential. So you need to get yourself a tool chain and uh, a make and an orc and a sed and uh, various other bits and bobs. So there's always some set of stuff you've got to cross build. And there's an interesting question of how much of it you cross build before you go, now I've got enough to call this a real useful computer and now I can start natively building. Documentation packages are interesting because there's lots of those, you know, oh, damn, I need tech. Um, <laughs> uh, and they're going to cross-build tech. So these tools will let you do analysis to say, how many packages do I need to cross-build before I can kind of swap over? Um, here's some statistics. How many things are required? Uh, how many things are essential? There's twice as much required stuff in Ubuntu. I didn't know that. These tools are really quite interesting. Um, somewhere in here was the... So, yes, reduced disk. So, in practice, if you're running this on unstable, there's 38,000 binary packages and 18,000 source packages. Really, really slow. It takes like three and a half hours to do an analysis. So um, pretty much the first thing he did after using it for five minutes was uh, wrote this, which basically says, uh, make me a reduced set. Uh, so the default reduced set is uh, essential and required. And you can add a few packages and say, and I also want this, this, and this. And then it will give you a list of how many source packages and binary packages, that is, uh, and make a packages set of it, and then you can do your analysis on that, uh, which speeds things up by uh, orders of magnitude. Um, so that is the set of stuff which can be built from itself, basically. Uh, so yes, here's some numbers. There's uh, lots of packages in Debian. We knew that. Um, a basic required and important set turns out to be 645 source packages which is slightly bigger than I expected. Um, and it's possible that these tools don't actually work right yet. They are brand new. This, we discovered this last week. Um, but it's quite fun to play with. Uh, what else have we got that's worthy of note? Yeah, so there's the point. It takes three and a half hours, nearly four hours, to analyze the whole thing, or 12 minutes to analyze the sensible size set. Um, this is for analyzing how many things do I have to cross-build in order to be able to build the rest of it. Um, so for example, for that sort of 2,400 odd packages in the required and essential set, you need to cross build 55 things in unstable. Anyhow, that doesn't sound too bad. Um, Dudley Bar. That was some slightly different analysis where you, it turned out you needed to cross 158 things. So that's the kind of size of stuff we need to do before to to effectively have achieved a bootstrap uh, and be able to work on the native machine afterwards. Just to clarify, you cross-build 158 packages, and that gives you a big enough set to natively compile the rest. That's right. This is for bootstrapping a new architecture. That's correct. 
Um, so there's now a kind of interactive thing. You can push little buttons and say, uh, what happens if I try and do this package? What does it depend on? Um, download it and have a play. Uh, and, and get dot pictures. Most of the rest of this you don't care about. Uh, yeah, so we can generate some pretty pictures showing classic dependency cycles. So the part of this that's not finished is the analysis of the dependency cycles which need breaking. So we can now find them, or at least some of them. Um, and we need to add the information about staged builds to say, I can build this package without the database part, I don't care, uh, in order to make this linear. Um, so that is being worked on for the rest of GSOC. Uh, and we hope we will have uh, something which can actually run through a bootstrap of, say, the first 100 odd packages, assuming they all cross build. Ha ha. Um, so, yes, uh, that's my time up. And uh, here's a little bit of uh, thank you very much to people for uh, helping out, because I haven't done most of this work. Other people have done most of this work. Um, I just hassle people. Um, so, yes, it's always dangerous listing names, but all those people have definitely been helpful. Um, <laughs> others have to, I'm sure. I think that's all for now. Um, so for people who are, have an interest in this subject or thought any of that was um, relevant, um, we'll be spending another hour or so. Uh, I have a list of, I mentioned some of the things there, there's a few others. Uh, what do we think we should be doing about X, Y, and Z? Which packages should be providing what? Um, to what degree do we assume QEMU and so on? Uh, and yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>